I'm Barbara Minkowitz. I'm a pediatric orthopedist at Morristown and Atlantic Health, and I have a title called Medical Director of um, Pediatric Bone Health, and I consider posture part of bone health. So, as background, smartphones, tablets, computers, and other handheld technology have become parts of daily living. National parent surveys have found that 98% of homes with children have a mobile device, a tablet, a smartphone, etc. 52% were what was found only six years ago. The average time children spend with their handheld devices each day is rising. It was five minutes in 2011, 15 in 2013, 48 in 2017. So how common is back pain in children? In the past, it was uncommon. And you know, I'm doing this more than two decades since my residency. And it was always, if a child came in with back pain, well, you need to look for something bad. But that's not the case anymore. We're seeing a lot more. And the rate increases with age. By the age of 15, 20 to 70% of kids would report some back pain if you ask them. And I see these little 8, 9, 10-year-olds who have back pain. And it's related to the technology they're using. Common causes are muscular strain, injury, overuse, core muscle imbalance, or weakness, which contributes to pain. And I see a lot of core muscle um, problems with these children. They just simply don't have them. If we look at the cor correlation between technology and pain, you can see from the first graph how, you know, from year 2011 to 2017, how much technology is being used. And you can see, even though the second graph is in adults, if we had something in children, it would be similar. You see how back pain is increasing as well. It's not just the children that are being affected by technology, but that's what we're going to discuss today. So what's the issue with tech usage? Well, you get a child tilts his head forward while bent over a phone or a computer, causing strain on muscles, tendons, ligaments, and the neck. They get shoulder and neck pain, you know, as common complaints. The children's round their back. You see that picture there? and their shoulders while using tech that adds pressure to the upper and lower back. And I just look at those, and I don't remember anybody doing that when I was a kid or when, you know, or 20 years ago, and I just cannot figure out what they're doing. It's important to correct bad posture in children or their bodies over time may adapt to these bony and soft tissue changes, which may be permanent. So, you know, you keep your back in that position. It's too stretched out. You're on, you're, you got muscle imbalance, and that's what we're here to discuss. So the effects of poor posture on your alignment, you get postural kyphosis. Kyphosis, you're, you're supposed to have a normal amount of curvature to your back when you look at it from the side. Um, we're talking about excessive. And you know people call this rounding of the back. Some muscles become tight, short contracted in the front because you're leaning forward. Um, your shoulders are, we call it protracted, they're, they're stuck forward. Everything, all those muscles that are supposed to let you bring your shoulders back, you don't ever stretch them out, you're stuck. Um, the bones become wedged anteriorly, and you can see in the second picture here how you're supposed to have little rectangular vertebrae, but if you have pressure on the front all the time, you can actually get some compression there. You get other deformities. You know, it, it, Posture, bad posture can encourage scoliosis, and so part of scoliosis treatment is postural therapy. You, can, you have chest deformities, such as pectus carinatum, and I feel like I see these progressing more in children that, are, that have poor posture than I have in the past. You have poor balance. Long-term changes to the spine can impact motor skills and affect balance. Fatigue. Slouching reduces lung capacity and depth of respiration and may increase fatigue due to decreased oxygenation. And pain, as we discussed, neck, back, joint pain, headaches. Dr. Babineau, our neurologist, is going to discuss that. You have decreased self-esteem. Slump posture is associated with lack of self-confidence and exhibiting negative moods. And in fact, when you're tired, you know, it's the end of the day and life is just getting to you, it's going to be very hard to stand up. 
And so that's, you know, that's where that slouch posture comes in. Athletic form depends on posture. Okay, poor posture causes limited excursion of the shoulders. Like I said, your shoulders are forward, they're stuck shell forward. It results in arm, shoulder, neck, back pains, and sprains. So now you have these baseball players, and they come in, they've got shoulder sprains because they're trying to bring their arm back, they're not doing things properly. They want me to fix their shoulder. I can't fix their shoulder if I don't fix their posture because they're pulling on whatever sprain now. And so I send them to physical therapy, not just for their shoulder, but for their posture. You got to get them up, get them off of it, and you know, work on stretching everything out and getting them the excursion that they're expecting to have there that's not there. And so it's going to affect your swimmer strokes. It'll affect your running. Um, you can have pain from trying to force a motion with compensation for loss of motion by substitution of other muscles. So you're trying to bring your arm back. You can't. You're doing something you shouldn't. You're pulling. You're going to have problems. Technology. Tech time cannot be fully controlled. I mean, that's, you know, that ship has sailed. Okay, yes, you know, there are parental control apps. You can schedule alerts and time limits for no tech time, but at some point, you're going to lose control. We really need to teach children how to use tech properly. We need to teach correct posture. This is imperative to prevent injury. Visual aids are helpful. If you take a picture of your child from the side the way they are, and then you make them sit up and show them the difference, some of them really don't realize how bad they look and that you know, you're not just you know, being a nag. There is a reason why they need to sit up. So what can we do if a child spends a lot of time on tech? Well, one thing, stand up, stretch. Consider a stand-up desk to reduce strain on the neck and back. You know, get them up. Proper chairs can help. Poorly fitted chairs and poor posture can lead to poor handwriting. So not only you know, are you going to have bad problems, but some children have trouble learning how to write. And if you fix their posture, then suddenly they can progress. So these things are very intimately um, you know, integrated. Proper chairs, you, um, you need chairs that encourage proper body mechanics and ergonomics. Common issues include improper height, chairs that encourage slouching, you want to ensure that the monitor, the chair, and the desk are set correctly for the child. And you know, if you have someone that's a gamer, there are some gaming chairs out there that are options. And there are all kinds of chairs like that. You want to encourage correct posture in all positions. So basically, bring the tech up to eye level. Bring the arms up or prop on a table to engage correct posture. And you know, when I have these children in my office, for instance, today, I had a child that had really bad posture, came in to check for scoliosis, but it was really a postural issue. And I said, OK, we're going to send you for postural training, and you are not allowed to text like this. You have to bring your head up and bring your, you know, bring your phone up. So no more looking down. And you know, this is something that the child needs to hear in front of the parents, because then the parents have something that's enforceable, because, well, the doctor said it. Take a break from tech. Shut down the electronics and engage in active movements. Encourage outside play. Unplug. So now you want to ask about pain or discomfort when using tech. If you don't ask them, then you won't even know that, yeah, they are having some pain. So parents should ask their children if they're having back pain or neck pain. Many will admit it, and then this can be addressed. Listen to your child's body. If they are complaining or they admit to pain, you have to sort of think, is this due to posture, or should I take them to, a to the pediatrician and see if there's something else going on? Remember, good posture is not instinctual for everyone. Okay, You aren't born knowing good posture. It's taught. It's a learned behavior for most people. I think there are, are some people that really just stand straight, but uh, mo for most of us, it's work. It's a struggle. So what can we do? Well, we can do an orthopedic evaluation. We get physical therapy, posture-specific home exercises to promote core strength and stability. These exercises you know, require the floor, a yoga mat, a yoga ball, a door frame. And they're designed to help realign posture. 
And so, you know, we have this video that we're going to share with the public where we do this. Um, posture bracing. I really like posture bracing. And I sort of got into it before I got into the whole posture um, issue, or as I was getting into it, when I had a couple of children that had these shoulder problems that I couldn't fix unless I literally took a piece of stockinette and tied it like a figure eight around their back to, to hold their arms back. And then I said, well, okay, you know, this looks kind of stupid. Go on Amazon and buy a real posture brace, which they did. And that was helpful, and the children actually got better. So at that point, I really started looking into it. And I actually bought some for the office, and I made everybody wear them. And they're helpful. It's a dynamic brace. It doesn't fix your problem. You pull the straps tight enough, not so they give you sores, but so it's annoying. And every time you lean forward, the light bulb goes off, and you stand up straight again. And so you're exercising those muscles constantly. And I have children who say, you know, after I've worn that, when I take it off, I know, how, you know, I know what to do. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel different. And even though, if you read the directions, they'll say, well, wear it for one hour a day. My kids can wear it to school for six hours a day, and that's how they get better. So depending on the problem, I may encourage more use than one hour a day. Backpack concerns are sort of decreasing in intensity now that we have so much tech because the bags are lighter. But still, you shouldn't carry more than 15% of your body weight um, in your bag, which is not exactly what happens. Um, I've actually weighed kids' bags, and they're 40 pounds. Um, you want to encourage them to use lockers for storage, bring home only what's necessary, and wear it right. You want the straps on both shoulders. If they have a waist strap, you know, they can use that. Uh, the straps need to be adjusted properly, and you need to distribute the weight with the heavier items towards your back, low and centered. And then, you know, I'm a very big bone health person. At the end of the day, you need strong bones to hold you up. You need your muscles to be functioning optimally, which they won't do if you're not healthy. So I like to promote, you know, patients to work on this, you know, to take their multivitamin, to take vitamin D, calcium, vitamin C. And I have conversations with just about every patient about whether or not they're a milk drinker, an almond milk drinker, a soy milk. Um, and we discuss where, you know, orange juice with calcium, where are you going to get your calcium from? You know, and at the end of the day, they can always take Tums, but they have to get calcium from somewhere. You can't make a cake without flour. You can make a tort, but it's not the same thing. So vitamin D is needed for calcium absorption. We know that. And there's not enough vitamin D from the sun in New Jersey, not enough from the food. Bottom line, you need to do at least some supplementation. Generation hun Hunchback, Orthopedic Effects of Technology, is a study that we started this past summer. So the idea is to understand technology's con contribution to orthopedic complaints. Technology as defined by texting, video games, computer use, TV, tablet, et cetera. And orthopedic complaints being poor posture, shoulder pain, neck pain, back pain, any kind of pains that could be related to posture. Our goal is to determine if intervention helps with these complaints. And you would think it would. And interventions would include tech modification. You know, just bring the phone up. You know, get your head up. Decrease tech time. We only ask them to decrease a little bit because it's unreasonable to think that any kid is going to decrease their tech time by very much. Uh, physical therapy, posture bracing, and awareness of the issue. Just having the discussion with them and like I said, showing them a picture of what they look like, you know, hunched versus sitting straight is helpful. And asking them, do you really want to be a hunchback? Because that's where you're headed. The study measures change in strength of posture muscles over three months. Our study population are those that have poor posture. And many have poor posture without complaints of pain. Some will report pain when you explicitly ask them that. And many of those with poor posture are willing to get postural training. Some are not interested, you know. So you can lead a horse to water. And it's kind of funny. When you look at these kids, they look terrible. The parent is sitting there, and you go, 
you know, would you like to be in this study? It's just a survey. We'll talk to you. We'll explain to you. We'll help you. And they're like, no, I'm not interested. So, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, there are those that come in specifically for a posture or a pain. Of those treated, parents remark on how quickly the children look and feel better. So if you actually get somebody to buy in, it's not that hard to fix them. We do a trunk extensor endurance test for the study. So this is a time test to gauge endurance of trunk extensor muscles. And these are very weak when you have poor posture. So you lay the patient on the stomach, ask them to raise their torso and arms off the ground as illustrated here, and you time how long they can hold this. And so this is a metric for us to figure out how strong these kids are. And you know, you really, it's very hard to do this if you don't have trunk muscles. So our protocol is basically we have our initial visit where we identify the patients, we randomize them into different groups of interventions, and then the plan is to call them at three months or email them and get some feedback. So we're really very early on in this study. So you know there, there's only so much to say at this point, but we can say that we're I'm only you know we've only we're only registering patients that are at least 12 years old into this because I feel like the kids that are less than 12 really are not all mature enough to follow the rules and go to physical therapy and gain something from it, and it's a waste of time almost you know in kids that are less than 12. I'll do it if they have pain, but I sort of shake my head and I say, you know, this kid will probably bounce back and need to do this again in a year. But if you're 12 and up, then I have more hope for you. So we have 28 per participants. We really want to get a good group going. We're not in a rush. There's plenty of poor postured kids out there, so it shouldn't be that hard to get 250 in it. You know, that's assuming that they're interested in it. Um, we have 12 participants with a personal history of back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, or um, kyphosis, not really scoliosis, because we don't, those are not um, entered into the study. And participants reported significant technology use, and um, um, I don't have the exact time on this, but um, you know, can be, I, I had one kid that actually spent eight hours on the phone a day and the mother had no idea. She came in for back pain. And I was like, well, maybe we should change that. So, you know, they're spending a lot of time on their various devices. Some of them are spending time on it in school as part of school. And you can't take that away. And that's going to be, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be spending time on their tablets or computers um, that are actually given to them by the, the school. When asked about neck angles while texting, um, all had poor posture with angles ranging from 15 to 60 degrees. And some of those kids that will admit to 15 degrees, if you really look at them when they're not paying attention, they're tilted down more than that. But the ones that are 60 degrees, I they, they give me a headache. <laughs> I look at them, my back starts hurting. Um, 27 out of 28 participants believed that um, some kind of intervention could improve their posture. And we discuss with them, we ask them, you know, what do you think would help your posture? And these are the things that they thought could be helpful. You know, changing the position of the hands or the body during text use, limiting amounts of time, wearing a posture brace, doing physical therapy, self-awareness, or modifying chair use. 23 parents acknowledged a postural issue with their children, so not even everybody that was there that clearly had bad posture thought their child really had an issue. And you know, the other end of it is that some of the parents have pretty bad posture too. Um, and then we had 15 participants who had already tried to correct their posture but weren't getting anywhere. They hadn't been to anyone in particular, but they were thinking about it and trying to do something about it. So Generation Hunchback School Implemented Posture Education. We need to educate children about the effects of poor posture and ways to improve and maintain good posture. I mean, that's really, really where it comes down to. And children spend the majority of their waking hours in school, so this would be a good place to start. 
24 participants had tablets or computers provided by the school. So the school is promoting tech use, right? One participant went to a school that teaches correct posture, one. Two attended a school that teach about the effects of too much screen time, that's it. So that's something that we need to address. Now I once had a patient who I was following for postural kyphosis. I mean, he literally measured 70 degrees on the, on the x-ray. So he was almost 90 degrees hunched over. And I thought this kid was gonna end up needing surgery, but I sent him for therapy. Came back to my office standing pinned straight. I thought someone operated on him. Turns out he was ROTC in high school, and they absolutely fixed his posture problem. So I always kid around with people, well, you could sign your kid up ROTC. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, here are some pictures that show how nice the posture is in the military. The bottom ones are Chinese, and you know, they're trying to teach these people how to stand straight, and they're using, you know, these literally a rod down your back to get you to line up. And they, the, they also start in high school with these, you know, these programs for their children to stand straight. Talking about cultural diversity, that's a big thing these days, so we're gonna go there now. So if you're from one of these countries, you know, um, Malaysia, India, um, you know, and, and all these different Asian countries, South American countries where people carry baskets on their heads. The, if you ever look at these women or these children, they are standing so straight because if they text, if they, you know, there's no texting here. If they, if they tilt their head down, then, you know, it's over. They're gonna lose their load. They're aware of their surroundings. They're balanced. They've got great posture. There was an article in the Financial Times this past week, 10-11, 2019, and it was titled, and this was in the London Financial Times, How to Look Younger, Thinner, and More Powerful, Perfect Posture. So, you know, obviously, this kind of picture, this is obviously an old picture, and I don't think it would go over too well if it was, you know, in, in one of the New York newspapers, but um, it really shows you how, you know, how people think about posture. Um, poor posture contributes to poor health, you know, as I mentioned earlier, poor circulation, headaches, fatigue, breathing problems, lump posture, affects the diaphragm, causing shallow breathing, elevated stress levels. People in the gym focus on what they see in the mirror, which is the frontal plane. So they're busy trying to make themselves look good from the front, but they don't turn to the side and get their shoulders up. Um, remind yourself by using post-it notes to sit up straight. This was one of the things in the article that they felt that if you just put post-it notes around to just as a reminder, every time you looked at them, you could use that as a dynamic sort of way of getting up. Um, poor posture is prevalent and seen on the fashion runway, and you know they were remarking on how it really ruins the clothing that they're trying to show you. And this wasn't something that you used to see. And you can tell if you're having a bad day when you're slumped over, so if you want a poker face, you've got to get up. Future goals would be to advance good posture alongside technology. It's not going away, so we need to figure out how to live with it in a healthy way. Don't allow evolutionary regression. Let's stay up. Don't accept generation hunchback as a done deal. Engage children's interests in posture. Get parents involved, get teachers involved, get school nurses involved. Get involved. Thank you. So um, I'm Shannon Babineau, I'm a child neurologist. Um, I work out of Morristown and um, Atlantic Health. Uh, my primary interest is in headaches, so that's the bulk of my practice is in uh, pediatric headache. Uh, as part of that, I do a lot of concussion work as well and post-traumatic headache. So I was asked to talk today about headaches in children and how screens can play a role or screens in technology. Um, so it's actually not something i would thought a lot about specifically, um, although I can certainly tell you a lot of parents would love me to talk about screen use when they come in for their headaches. So I think actually it was very helpful for me to reframe this so I can um, kind of arm, arm my discussions a little bit better. 
Um, so you already heard um, there's clearly a lot of uh, high, uh, high media use in our children. Um, the quotes now are that youth are consuming media for the same amount of time most adults spend at work. Um, and these are nice um, infographics. I don't know if you guys ever go on the CDC website, but the CDC website has a tremendous amount of, a lot of really beautiful visual representations for all different types of health issues. And for screen use, um, they have some really nice information if you're looking to share, uh, share with your kids. Um, so you can see that kids age eight to 10 spend about six hours a day on some form of screen. And this is not including uh, what's used at school. So this is only for entertainment purposes. Um, 11 to 14 year olds are spending nine hours a day and 15 to 18 are spending seven and a half hours a day. So this is a tremendous amount of time in front of some kind of screen. Um, and this is data that was pulled several years ago. So you have to imagine that it's probably only expanded from here. So as far as kind of what's been out there about headache, is there anything that's actually been looked at? Does screen use cause headache, which is the question that I get um, very frequently. There's some kind of smaller studies. It's nothing that's overwhelmingly um, definitive, but there, there was a look at primary school children 10 to 12 years old that found that those um, who used the computer with a high frequency uh, did have a higher rate of both tension type headache and migraines. Um, and then a separate study that showed that, that kids that used both television, computer, and played uh, video games showed a unique association with headache when they controlled for other factors, and that was in boys, whereas girls, video games, I guess, didn't matter, but TV viewing and computer use seemed to lead to higher headache frequency. Um, and a separate study that also looked at kind of trying to separate out the fact that kids that had headaches and watched a lot of TV, maybe it was because they weren't active, but they actually controlled for physical activity, and it seemed that something within the screen use itself was uh, triggering headaches, uh, not just because they were sitting still all the time. So that led to the question, or leads me to the question, how could screen use, physical screen use, be associated with headache? Um, and so these are the three things that I kind of came up with, um, and I'm going to go through each one. Uh, number one, it certainly could be a migraine trigger, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Anyone that has migraines, takes care of patients with migraines, um, knows that screens, light, photosensitivity is a huge part of migraines, so certainly that's a big piece. Sleep disruption, which is basically what I spend 90% of my day talking about, uh, sleep hygiene and, and sleep health in my headache patients, um, and I think this is probably a, a big piece of it. And then some visual dysfunction uh, as well, including both visual acuity, um, something called computer vision syndrome, which I learned about also when I was trying to read about this, and visual tracking issues. So how could screen use be associated with headache? So certainly migraines, right? And again, that's probably the largest part of my practice is, is treating kids with migraines. This is a list, um, it was done of a, a poll of children. So these are all pediatric patients with migraine, asking them to list their triggers for migraine, um, as well as have their parents list their triggers for migraine. And they kind of go from left to right as far as most common trigger to least common trigger. Um, and you can see all the way on the left uh, is stress which is another big one. But you can see very close to that side on the left are things like video games and lights. Um, and that we know that if you have a migraine, photosensitivity is one of the big criteria for migraine. Um, so certainly, if you have a migraine, if you're someone who's prone to migraines, and then you have to sit in front of a screen, or you are choosing to sit in front of a screen for whatever those numbers were, eight hours a day, you're going to have a worse headache. Um, there's also many studies that have shown both in adults and children that digital screens, computers, video games um, are all, can be an independent trigger for migraine. So a child that has no headache and you're asking them when their headache starts, they can pinpoint excessive screen use or sitting in front of the computer screen for a certain amount of time will bring on a migraine. So this, the number that you can see here, this is more than 50%. This is closer to 70% of kids that have computer screen use or um, light sensitivity as a trigger for their migraines. So the other big way that screen use could be associated with uh, triggering migraine is how sleep deprivation plays into a role. And you can see that right to the left, so even more commonly than screen use, lack of sleep is one of the biggest migraine triggers. And so um, this largest portion of what I wanted to talk to you about was how sleep gets disrupted with screen use, but certainly if you have a lot of poorly uh, constructed sleep, you're going to have a lot more headaches. So 
Um, I think sleep is probably one of the biggest things that is kind of adding to this. Uh, we also know that most children are not getting the sleep that they need. Um, so you can see again on the left, uh, the recommended, this is the, again the CDC website, the CDC recommended hours of sleep that are needed for each age bracket. And you can see what's uh, recommended, which is the paler yellow orange, and then what's actually achieved. Um, so in six to 10 year olds, the recommendation is 11 hours. Um, above 11, the recommendation is nine to 10 hours, and that goes all the way until you're 18. Um, about 30% of preschoolers, which is really young, um, are not getting enough sleep. And certainly, um, everyone knows that teenagers and a lot of older children are not getting asleep, uh, up sleep. I've seen up to 90% quoted as, as insufficient sleep. So it's a huge, huge problem. So we know that screen-based media devices are present in the bedrooms of up to 75% of kids, and this is data also probably that was collected in the kind of early 2010, so I'm sure again that this number has gone up. Um, about 60% of adolescents admit to uh, keeping a, bed, a phone in the bed with them. 45% use it as their alarm. Um, it's often a big shock to them that there are things called alarm clocks when you ask them to take their phone away. Um, but so most of them use that as their excuse as to why they need that phone there with them. 60% uh, of adolescents report viewing or interacting with the screen in the hour before bedtime, which we know is that kind of golden hour when you really need to be uh, detoxified of your screen. Um, and that has shown, it, I th thought that this was interesting, that they did one population study of kids o over the age of six, and just the fact that the screen is in the bedroom, so it doesn't matter if they're using it, not using it, but if you just check that as a positive thing, um, it's very predictive that they're not going to get enough sleep. So whether you ask how much sleep they're actually getting or not getting, if they're keeping a screen in their bedroom, they probably are not getting enough sleep. So how is it possible that the screen is affecting sleep? Um, certainly, number one, they're interesting, right? Particularly phones and video games. They um, are engaging with you. Social media is engaging with you. Um, so when you're interested in it, it's very hard to put it down and to actually go to sleep. Um, it also does a lot of time displacement, right? It makes you fall asleep later. Um, it changes how long you're sleeping. Um, it affects the way you're sleeping, the quality of your sleep, and that what, last one's a duplicate. It's actually sleep disruption, right? So people who have phones and alerts and bings and it's on silent but it's still buzzing, all of that's affecting the, the quality and the, the uh, duration of your sleep. And then also the light can affect your uh, circadian or sleep physiology and alert, level of alertness. So, these are a couple of studies, um, really just kind of looking specifically, it was one large study that pooled 25 different studies about sleep to look at these particular factors. And basically it kind of proves what we would expect, right? So that um, as far as uh, when do you start sleeping, so what's your s sleep onset? Um, two of the studies didn't find any significant association, but three of them did find that between using bedtime social media or other smartphones, kids went to bed later. Um, and that, it, that also was associated if kids also met criteria for internet addiction. So that, I would say the bulk of those studies show that this, if, if you have a screen in your room or you're using a screen, you're gonna go to bed later than you would if you didn't. It also affects the total amount of sleep that you're having, which would make sense if you're going to bed later. Um, so uh, all of these uh, showed that any of these kinds of things associated with nighttime sleep shortened the number of hours that you were sleeping. Um, all of the studies that they identified for sleep quality showed that if you had bedtime mobile phone use or social media use, um, you had poor sleep quality when they asked measures about how they felt, how well they slept. Uh, they had a poor night's sleep if they're using screens. And lastly, for sleep disruption, they also showed that if you have a bed, bedtime use or you have screens in your room at night, um, there's definitely sleep disruption between all of the different kinds of um, possibilities. And the other big thing is, um, you know, naturally we all wake up in the middle of night, the mid middle of the night, and so if you have your phone there and you can reach for it, then you can use it at two o'clock in the morning as opposed to if you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and it's not there, you're more apt to go back to sleep. So that's part of it as well. Um, something I thought was interesting um, is that people have started to look at small screens versus television, right? Television's been around for a while. 
Um, and it does seem that the small screens are more disruptive than television. Um, so they've looked at the presence of a small screen versus a TV in the sleep, sleep environment. Um, and it seems that the small screen is more highly related with poor sleep quality, not having enough time, whereas the television didn't necessarily interrupt their sleep or make their sleep quality any worse. And the question is, why is that possible? And I think probably a large portion of it, again, is how engaged you are with that screen, right? So TV is a very passive thing, whereas video games, phones, all of that's very interactive. So again, it's that psychological activation. And the other thing that's possible is that the device is much closer to your eye. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, melatonin release. And that's how we think that's what the screen's actually doing, is disrupting our melatonin release. And so because it's closer to your eye, it has a stronger effect on your melatonin. So it does seem that um, even though screens have been around for a long time in the bedroom, the, at the addition of all these small screens into our personal space is making a bigger impact. So how does light or screen light affect uh, our sleep? Most people think this is mediated primarily through melatonin. So melatonin is a natural hormone that's secreted from our pineal gland, which is um, this picture at the bottom. I don't know if there's like a little pointer thing here. No? Um, the picture at the bottom just shows a, kind of a nice cartoon picture of a nighttime sleepy brain. And your pineal gland just sits right here in the back of your brain and secretes melatonin. And its uh, secretion is controlled by light exposure. So you can see when you measure melatonin rates throughout the day, the pineal gland starts to produce melatonin kind of in the evening around 8 o'clock, and it peaks kind of right in the middle of the night when there's the least amount of light exposure. So this is a natural melatonin curve, and it's very much linked to light. So this is kind of one of the main drivers as far as our circadian rhythm. Um, as far as how we feel tired. So melatonin is one of these things that makes us tired, makes us sleepy, and it's directly correlated to our light exposure. So the light emitted from screens um, is definitely affecting our melatonin release. And the composition of light, specifically from electronic devices, um, is enriched in this type of light called blue light, which I think people have probably heard of, blue light is a short wavelength light that is more effective at suppressing melatonin. So not only, so all types of light can suppress melatonin and people can have difficulty with sleep also because they're exposed to a lot of fluorescent lighting right before they go to bed. So bright lights in any form can suppress your melatonin, but blue light is particularly good at that. And blue light is what comes out of our electronic devices at a much higher rate than natural ambient lighting, sun lighting, and fluorescent lighting. So you've got this like super powerful melatonin suppressor coming out right by our faces right before bedtime. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is that kids are more sensitive to this light suppression than adults. Kids naturally have larger pupil sizes, so they let more light in to begin with. And they also have really nice crystal clear lenses, right? They haven't developed any cataracts yet, so they get really nice blue wavelength into their brains. Um, suppressing their melatonin. And this was uh, something that I thought was pretty helpful to just see kind of, a, uh, kind of really how effective light exposure is in melatonin suppression. Um, so this was a study that was done on primary school kids and adults. And what they did is they brought them, they described very much how they brought them to this office building one evening. It was kind of a strange description in the, in the journal article. But basically, they were brought to an office building and exposed to um, two scenarios. The first one was dim lighting, and the other one was bright lighting um, on two separate evenings. And someone came and measured their melatonin in their saliva every hour around their bedtime. And so they documented melatonin levels around the time when it should be, um, when it should be kind of coming up in natural, its natural way, in natural circadian rhythm. And so what the top part shows is these are adults on the top. And they show the time, so about 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. And you can see kind of their natural melatonin start to pick up around these times. And this is in dim lighting. Um, and then you can see when they're exposed the next day or however many days later, the same time when the light is very bright, like office building light, um, you can see that there's definitely uh, less of a surge when you should normally be getting your melatonin surge. 
Look what happened to the poor kids, right? So similarly, they had, it's not as dramatic as what happens with the adults, but they have their peak a little bit earlier. Um, hopefully the kids were trying to go to bed a little bit earlier than the adults. They're just flat, right, when they get exposed to this. And a lot of time this persists for hours and hours and hours after the exposure. Um, just a slightly different way to look at it, you, to look at the difference in suppression, like how much did their melatonin shift from dim lighting to bright lighting, um, and you can see that the suppression for adults is about 50%, and the suppression for kids is about 80, 80 to 90%. So a really dramatic melatonin suppression with bright light exposure. And then they also measured their pupil sizes, um, and you can see that adults, you know, obviously in dimmer light you have bigger pupils. Um, so both, that's true for both, but kids are bigger at baseline. And then in the bright light they had a more dramatic um, change, but it's still, bigger than the adult pupil. So again, the light that's getting in there is getting in there even more. Um, so this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I just wanted to show you that um, part of where uh, we talk about trying to help people, particularly when I'm trying to help people who have sleep-related issues, screen-related issues, and headache-related issues, um, and I'm sure you've seen the use of melatonin as kind of a natural method for helping people to sleep, um, there's definitely recommendations on how you can do this. Uh, the, the biggest difficulty with melatonin is that it can work in two different ways when you take it um, as a pill, as a supplement. So some people actually, when they take uh, exogenous uh, melatonin, it works right away to make them sleepy. There's a subset of people where that happens. Um, and so in those people, you can take it, so it's, it's here, it says as a sleep inducer, you can take it 30 minutes before bedtime. But that doesn't work for everyone. Um, a lot more typically, it actually works better if you take it kind of in a couple of hours before desired bedtime. So you're trying to get it right as that melatonin surge is starting, and you're trying to make it surge further, and that's going to help you fall asleep. So more typically, it's helpful to take melatonin a couple of hours before your desired bedtime. Um, and so this is just some guidance about how to use melatonin and different ways to adjust your melatonin dosing if you wanted to try it um, uh, to try to help with sleep onset. So that's these two slides. Um, and the other thing I, I do a lot, um, I actually don't know who this, you know, I don't know this guy personally, but he's a pediatric sleep physician and he has a public website um, that's super, super helpful. Um, and it's not, um, it does have more sciencey stuff for, um, for people that are interested in it, but it has a lot of advice on sleeping in kids. Um, and it's a really nice resource that I refer my parents to all the time um, if they want to read about it. Um, so you can see this is just the, the front web, web page. He has Sleep 101, Sleep Training. So he'll do it for young, there's stuff about training for infants and stuff on there too. But there's a large section on sleep in teens and a lot of stuff that's really basic sleep hygiene, but it's like a really nice place for people to go if they want to read more about this. Um, and just a last piece, there is some uh, data to support melatonin use, not only in um, just with screen and sleep uh, difficulty, but also with headache. Melatonin separately, even though we think of it primarily as the hormone that makes us sleepy, actually does have a little bit of pain uh, pain mediation, it does have a little bit of anti-inflammatory uh, action and a little bit of an antioxidant. And so it is something that I, I certainly use kind of, it's one of those more first line things in people that are coming to me who are complaining of headache, who are complaining of sleep difficulty, um, supplementing with melatonin can be helpful and they've done some small trials with the use of melatonin and headache in kids and had efficacy with it. So the big things I think just to remember or to, to talk with uh, uh, kids about is number one, uh, the importance of sleep and sleep hygiene, which is this kind of corner over here. But the big piece I think I talk to people about is just the screens have to go away from the bedroom, period. Um, the TV has to come out, the computer has to go away, and the phone cannot be in the room at all, ever. And they can go to Walmart and buy an alarm clock and put batteries in that and put it by their bed. Um, but there is no reason for their phone to be in their room. And I really, you know, I think this is setting people up maybe for more healthy behavior. I'm sure 99.9% .9 of the people in this room sleep with the phone by their bed and we all know what trouble it gets us into. So I think if we're starting kids at a younger age to try to keep the bedroom as a screen-free place, I think we're setting people up for a better sleep hygiene uh, going forward. 
So just uh, the last couple minutes, I want to talk about how vision could be associated uh, with headache and with screen use. So um, a little bit about both acuity and tracking. So this is a busy slide. Sorry about that. But um, basically, a lot of people who come to see me for headache also uh, think it may be related to people's eyes. Um, and so a lot of, most of the time people have seen eye doctors before they've seen me. The chance that it's their acuity is pretty low. So it's very rare that people have primary headache problems because they can't see very well vision wise. Um, and there's been a lot of mixed studies about whether visual acuity um, could be affected, affecting people's headaches. Um, certainly if you have poor acuity, it is helpful to wear your glasses, um, but that's not necessarily going to be the big factor as far as reading, um, reading goes as far as with your headaches. Um, something that I did find a lot, this is actually in the optometry literature, it's not something I was familiar with, um, but it kept coming up anytime I was Google searching screens and headache, um, something that's been labeled as computer vision syndrome or digital eye strain, and I think um, certainly the eye doctors see it a lot. Um, and it's people coming in that are using tremendous amounts of screens and complaining of both dry eye, headache, kind of pain around the eye, pain with eye movement. And it seems that it's becoming you know, more and more prevalent in their practices um, with people that have really high screen use. So it does seem like the eye itself can be affected by having screen glare in your face all the time. Um, I think it's more interesting also to think a little bit more about visual tracking. Um, because when you think about screen use, particularly screen use maybe in school, um, and you're talking to kids about their headaches, and most of their headaches are during the school day, um, what is happening during the school day that could be triggering it? And trying to pull apart, is it just the screen glare? Is it that they didn't sleep enough? Or could it actually be something within their eyes, the way their eyes are working, that's triggering their headaches? Um, and so sometimes it's helpful to think about visual tracking, which is basically the way you follow stuff in space with your eyes. Um, and so sometimes when I hear that people's headaches are also accompanied with some of these other symptoms, I do think about visual tracking. So if they also come to me complaining of blurry vision or double vision, they say they lose their spot a lot when they're skipping words or when reading or copying notes off the board, if they're sensitive to motion, if they're sensitive to light, if they have those kind of eye strainy feelings when they're using a screen or they're doing a lot of reading or a hard time focusing. Um, those are all reasons to think about uh, visual tracking. And I'll just make a little plug for concussion history. Um, I was trying to figure out a way to work concussion into this talk and I couldn't really find a way. Um, but one of the big ways I see uh, visual difficulty, including with screens, is with patients that have had concussions. They're extremely sensitive to visual, visual, um, the visual environment. Um, and they, one of the biggest complaints they have besides headache is when they're doing their schoolwork, they really struggle um, to read. Um, and it's not even just, some of it's the processing, but some of it's just the actual act of reading. Um, and it's been shown repeatedly that concussion in itself makes it hard for your eyes to track. So it disrupts your visual tracking system. That's one of the kind of big areas that gets disrupted with concussion. And so if kids have a history of concussion, um, definitely thinking about the visual system as part of a thing that's contributing to their headaches and contributing to some of their other symptoms is helpful. Um, so what do I do in the office to, to look for visual uh, symptoms? I have them do smooth pursuit. So that's just if you've ever um, had a doctor do this to you, you know, when you follow their finger back and forth. So that's smooth pursuit, right? Tracking an object smoothly over space. Um, so that can be helpful to try to see if anything gets provoked when that happens. Um, psychotic dysfunction is actually the thing that tends to give people a bigger issue. So psychotic dif dysfunction is when your uh, saccade is when your eye moves from one point to the other point fast, back and forth. And so when you test it back and forth horizontally, it's looking between two points quickly. Um, and a lot of times what happens to people who have a hard time with saccades is they overshoot. So if they're supposed to be looking at this finger, they look over and they correct. And you can imagine if you have to do a lot of movement like that and you're always going over or behind or have to correct, it's distressing to your eyes. And so you can do in the office very quickly, have them go back and forth between your two fingers and you can get a sense. And I, you do it with a bunch of people who don't complain too so you can get a sense of what normal looks like. Um, but you can start to see that there are some people that really do struggle to get to each point. Same thing up and down, right? You can have vertical psychotic issues as well. And then the other big thing is um, convergence, right? So that's bringing an object in to your face 
um, and there's a certain point where for everyone pretty much uh, that object will double out um, but most people should be able most kids should be able to get within um, six centimeters of their nose um, and a lot of kids can have a hard time with kind of bringing objects in and near and the reason that's important with screens um, screens as well as with reading and kind of visual symptoms is that there's a lot of psychotic movement in school um, and a lot of psychotic movement when you're looking at screens or doing stuff um, on the computer. So you have to imagine when you're reading, you're jumping from word to word. And so if every time you jump from word to word, you overshoot and then have to correct, it's a lot of distress. If you're copying things from the board, every time you look up and down like this, and you're overshooting, you'll have a hard time. And um, convergence happens when you have to also look up and down, and you have to kind of make your eyes go in and out and in and out. Um, so this can definitely explain a lot of the symptoms people have that are visually related uh, triggers for their migraines. Um, and so there are things that you can kind of work on. You talked a lot about kind of uh, lots of important things as far as kind of positioning yourself. Um, extending your viewing distance. There are things you can do visually with things on text. And the nice thing about computers is you can change the font, you can change the spacing, you can make it easier for people to, do, to use that. Um, there's also some nice um, things you can use to block light. Um, there are a lot of glasses that are also available on Amazon that will block blue, blue, uh, blue light out. Um, you can change the uh, filter on your phones, um, or you can add this uh, app that filters out your phone and adjusts that short wavelength light out. Certainly taking breaks, um, all of these things can be helpful for people that are struggling. I think that's it. Thanks. Hey, guys. Um, so I'm going to talk about posture, and I'm going to talk about uh, how PTs see posture, OK? So I think when it comes to the word posture, a lot of people have a black and white view of it, okay? So they think of good posture, okay? And they think of bad posture, right? Um, when it comes down to it, I think the world of posture, there's more shades of gray than just black and white, okay? So I think posture is how your body is aligned in space, okay? This is a posture, right? If I was like this, that's also a posture. I think when it comes down to it though, all right, posture deals with function. Um, where we are today with technology, we love cell phones, we love TVs, and we love computers. And the very best way to use those things is like this, okay? If we were installing light bulbs for a living, we'd be here too much. We'd have a whole different realm of issues. but. We love TVs, we love computers, we love cell phones, okay? So the posture we choose to assume, for the most part, is this posture right here, okay? That leads to certain musculoskeletal issues. Um, posture can also affect mood. So they've found that people who stand like this for about 30 seconds, um, if they look at certain hormones in their blood, all right, they have hormones that are associated with good mood. Okay, posture also um, will affect perception. If I was up here like this, you guys would think different about me than if I was, if I was like this. All right, if I was like this, you would think that guy is kind of weird. Why is he standing like that? What's wrong with him? Um, when it comes down to it, like I said, we tend to be in certain kinds of postures too much. Okay, there's a trend in people sitting more. We rely on technology and sitting more now than we ever have, okay? So there's things we need to do to combat that. Um, there's effects of sitting. Uh, it can affect our cardiac health, musculoskeletal health. There's ways physical therapists look at functional movement to combat the effects of sitting, okay? In PT, we try and design corrective exercises based on people's postures of choice. And typically that deals with increasing spinal control and spinal mobility. Also, increasing activity levels is huge. Typically, if the posture that we choose is here, we're not moving enough. We're not exercising enough. 
if somebody's exercising two or three hours a day, posture is probably not an issue for them. They're getting variety. And variety and moderation are really key to keeping yourself healthy, especially when it comes to posture. All right, so about me, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I've been working for about six years now. I am board certified in orthopedics and I am the supervisor right next door. Okay, so I work next door to Dr. Minkowitz, Dr. Padavan, and Dr. Levine. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Minkowitz for this opportunity um, and also for all the patients she, uh, she sends us. We, we tend to see people um, differently than most PT clinics, all right? A lot of people that come in for their backs, it's too late for them. They come in and they can't move because their backs are rigid and their backs are painful. Um, Dr. Minkowitz typically sees people that are going down that road and says, hey, some intervention might help you now. A lot of those people don't listen to me. They could care less about what I say to them, but some people might listen to me. If I could save them from decades of pain because I got to them early, it makes a big difference. So thank you for that. All right, so when it comes to back pain, back pain is normal, all right? Most people suffer from back pain at some point in time, and suffer is a bad word. Uh, most people have back pain at some point in time, okay? The fact is, back pain is getting worse though. More people are disabled now from back pain than ever before, okay? You would think the way things are going, we are relying less on heavy manual jobs, all right? So we should have less disability due to back pain. We don't, all right? We tend to be sitting a lot more. We're assuming a couple of key postures more, and that's leading to higher rates of disability. All right, so I think you've seen this kind of snippet before, okay? But basically, we're using tech more. The best way to use your computer, the best way to use your phone is to do this, okay? If it wasn't, we wouldn't do it, all right? It's hard. I mean, Dr. Binkwood said, she tries to convince people to hold their phones up here and text. That's tough to do, all right? No one's gonna wanna do that for a prolonged period of time, all right? The fact is we're gonna be using technology more. So there's things we need to do to combat that. All right, screen time, okay? So what I found data-wise is most children spend seven hours or more a day on a screen for entertainment purposes. That is not including school. All right, so that is their TV, texting their friends, being on Snapchat, whatever, seven hours or more a day, okay? As far as TV goes, about three or more hours a day, all right? So we're spending a large chunk of our days, our waking hours in front of some kind of screen, typically probably in one or a couple specific postures that put our bodies in a certain position, all right? so. In the middle there, right, is a, uh, a clip from, uh, from Wally, -E, the movie, okay? So in PT school, a professor of mine took one class to sit us down and we watched the movie Wally. -E. I loved it. It was a great way to spend a class. But that being said, his point was, that's where we're going as a society, all right? And basically, if you haven't seen the movie, People travel around on these chairs. They never have to leave these chairs. Everything they want is right there on a screen. The food comes to them. And we're not that far away from that. I could order Domino's on my phone right now. I, can get, I could sit in my chair and get, I mean, whatever I want to my house delivered like that. All right, we don't have the chairs that, you know, kind of fly around yet, but we're not too far. All right, so things are going there. And it's our job to let people know if you live your life like that, there's gonna be consequences. All right, so there's another Wally picture there. All right, um, so basically, I'm sure you've all heard sitting's the new smoking, right? So what they're finding is the more hours that you sit in your day, um, it leads to higher rates of stroke, cardiac disease, cancers, okay? Some studies, um, they're, they're saying you could undo that through exercise. Some are saying, no, you can't. Um, they're saying that the more you sit, the higher the risk of these, these different diseases. Does it matter if you exercise? So they're saying you need to try and add some variety into your, your day and not sit as much. All right, so um, this talk is you know, postural syndrome of the pediatric spine. So what is postural syndrome? Um, so it's a prolonged static loading of the normal soft tissues in your spine uh, that result in a discomfort 
triggered by sustained mechanical stresses. Okay, so basically, if you sit in a certain position, if I were to slouch for five seconds, it's fine. Who cares about that? If I slouch for eight hours a day in class, five days a week, what tends to happen is you overstretch certain tissues, all right? Everything has a failure point. If I take an elastic band and I stretch it a little bit, it goes right back. If I stretch it a little bit too much though, it doesn't go right back. Things just change for good. All right, so that's what postural syndrome is. You are stretching things to the point where they deform, all right, and that'll cause pain. Um, typically, they are the best patients to treat, all right, because they come into the office and they say, you know, I'm in pain. You sit them up, the pain goes away, all right? But even though it's that simple, they still don't do that on their own. They still want to be here, all right? So they need a little bit more to help them be up straighter, okay? Um, from a PT perspective, when it comes to treating somebody with postural syndrome, there's a couple different things those people might need, all right? So you need the tools to sit upright. You need muscle endurance. You need flexibility. Um, you also need awareness. Dr. Minkowitz mentioned uh, braces you can wear. All right? The braces provide biofeedback. If you slouch, you feel a pull, that's your cue to come on up. All right? When it comes down to it though, most of the time posture is a choice. A lot of people, they slouch because they like slouching. They don't want to sit up straight. Sitting up straight is difficult, it's tough. Um, you know, it's our jobs to teach them that even though sitting up straight doesn't feel that great and it's tough, there's benefits to it. And if they slouch too much, that could lead them down a path that starts to become pretty tricky down the line. All right, so functional movement. Um, when somebody comes in to PT, the first thing I do is I see how they move functionally, okay? What the research has told us is having bad posture doesn't matter, okay? So there is no research saying bad posture causes more pain, okay? Um, I would love it if there was a cut and dry link, but there's not. Anecdotally, what PTs are seeing is that healthy bodies and healthy spines can assume a lot of different postures. As people have more chronic symptoms and worse symptoms, okay, the amount of movements they can do well decreases. So if somebody comes in to see me, I want to see how they can move, what postures they can get into, and if they're doing some postures worse than others, try and improve those imbalances. Okay? Um, if you look at that DNS picture right there, that's a toddler squatting. Toddlers have the best squat form that there is. If you want to get a PT fired up, show them a toddler squatting, they will love it. All right. Also, if you watch a toddler sit up on their, their iPad or whatever, perfect posture. All right. So inherently, we actually do have pretty good posture. It's just as we age, we start to stretch out certain things, those tissues, those feedback receptors, they start to work a little bit less effectively. And next thing you know, we go from here and we start to kind of hang out like this. If we don't un undo that, then we get stuck like this and that leads to all kinds of issues. If you look at the little diagram um, on the left-hand side, though, that kind of describes what I, I just uh, talked about. So posture relies on different systems working, okay? Uh, our biggest issue is because we do a lot of passive things, all right? We're on our cell phones quite a bit. Uh, we're watching TV too much. We rely on the, the passive uh, sub subsystem. We're relying on the chair that we're slouching against. We're relying on our bones and our ligaments as we hang out like this. We're not using the active subsystem. We're not using the muscles to support us, all right? Because using your muscles, if you're statically sitting for a long time, it's horrible. Nobody wants to do that, all right? It's exhausting, it burns, it hurts. It's a lot easier to go ahead and just kind of slouch down. All right, we start to overstretch certain tissues. Those receptor, uh, receptors don't work as well if you do that. And then the slouch, the slight slouch, becomes more pronounced the longer that you do do it. All right, so how do PTs combat that? All right, 
Um, healthy spines, they're mobile, all right? They could stretch in different directions and they have a lot of control, okay? So that yoga move right there, and yoga is a great thing for spinal health, all right? It relies on a lot of different postures you do not do in your daily life and it gives your spine variety. Um, but it takes a lot of flexibility in the back um, and it takes control to have the person stay like that. There is no chair supporting that woman right there. Okay, and I mean, honestly, if you think about slouch sitting, that's probably the opposite of sitting slouch right there, right? They're extending their spine, they're controlling their lower body, it's very active, um, and it helps to regain that active subsystem that controls your body and your spine. All right, like I said, good posture it depends on mobility and control of your three different spinal regions, your lumbar spine, thoracic spine, and cervical spine. I'm gonna break all those down, okay? So, if you look to the left, that's your typical slouch sitting posture, all right? In the lumbar spine, what happens when you slouch? You round the spine, it flexes, all right? So the corrective exercise for that would be spinal extension, all right? That's the cobra pose, or an upward dog or a press up, depending on what your school of thought is. Um, but you want to take these people's posture of preference where they're spending too much time and add a new posture, a corrective posture to undo some of that flexion stress they sustain throughout their days. All right. For your thoracic spine, okay, once again, you have flexion. Typically, if people are sitting too much, their chest start to go down. It's a lot easier to be down here than up there, okay? So once again, if we know we're flexing too much to sit, we want to correct that with thoracic extension, okay? So that's going to help to stretch the back and work those spinal extensor muscles. All right. As far as the cervical spine, all right, the human head weighs eight pounds. I learned that from Jerry Maguire. Um, the head gets a lot heavier if you slouch, if you slouch, if you look at the guy to the left, all right, the distance from the apex of his mid-back, I'm not sure if I could, no, I can't show that. Okay, so his head from his mid-back, all right, it's much further if you're here as opposed to being up straight, okay? So the head being forward puts a lot of stress on your lower cervical spine where a lot of your cervical issues happen. Also, in regards to headaches, we found that people tend to extend their upper cervical spine too much, it'll tighten their suboccipitals, all right, and lead to some strain on those nerves in there, all right? So in PT, for headaches, we try and extend the lower cervicals and flex the upper cervicals, all right? So that's that corrective exercise right there. Um, it's pretty much the opposite movement of that chin poke or that slouched head position. Okay. Now, as far as control goes, all right, so in addition to how we sit, all right, when we're slouching, um, we're also relying on something passively. It's either our ligaments, our bones, or a chair, right? Chairs do most of our work for us, and chairs are a pretty new invention too, all right? They're not, they haven't always been around. So our bodies aren't designed to constantly be sitting. So one way to work on the control of our lower body all right, is assume a squat. A lot of people cannot squat correctly, all right? They're not used to loading their lower body and their gluteals and their thighs to get into a seated posture without the chair, all right? Um, typically, when I see somebody who tore their ACL and I watch them squat, I know why they tore their ACL, all right? But I don't see them until after they tore their ACL. Um, if they worked on controlling their body before that injury, could that have prevented their injury? It's a possibility. Um, as far as the thoracic spine, right? So rounded shoulders. Typically, if we are texting or watching TV or whatever, we are rounding our shoulders, okay? That leads to tightness in the pectoral muscles, all right? And weakness in our scapular muscles, our shoulder blade muscles. So from a PT perspective, what we tend to do is work on the muscles that pull the shoulder blades back in different arm positions, all right? You mentioned uh, the overhead athlete. 
a thrower, okay? What we found is people that have rounded forward shoulder blades, they are more likely to impinge the rotator cuff, right? So ro uh, rotator cuff strains, rotator cuff tears, uh, labral tears, a lot more common with a poor shoulder blade position. So once again, we see some kids sometimes who they're young and they've had a rotator cuff repair, all right, or a UCL repair, and you see the way their shoulder blades move and you know exactly why it happened, but you saw them too late, which is why it's great when a physician gives us these people before it's too late. All right, and then last but not least, um, there's the, uh, the chin nod. Okay, so typically uh, that chin poked position, all right, it leads to, like I said, uh, upper cervical extension and lower cervical flexion, all right. That's going to also lead to an over reliance on your sternocleidomastoid muscle, all right. Um, the chin knot exercise, it helps to activate the intrinsic cervical spine muscles that help to stabilize that cervical spine, all right? So it inhibits the overactive large muscles and activates those smaller tiny muscles that can uh, stabilize your, um, your cervical joints for you. Okay, so in addition to corrective exercises for the spine and stretching and all that good stuff, Activity, all right, probably makes as much of a difference as anything else. I think in addition to the fact that we are sitting too much and we're slouching, we're not being active enough, okay? Even if somebody was to perform a corrective exercise program, I don't think that's enough variety for their body, okay? I tell my patients, movement is like the food pyramid, all right? The more variety you get to your body, the healthier all right, your muscles and your skeleton can be. All right, broccoli is fantastic. If all you did was eat broccoli, you'd have an issue. All right, you need a lot of movement and we just don't get enough. All right, so Play 60, um, it's an initiative by the NFL um, and what they recommend along with the AHA, uh, AHA is 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity every day. All right, so 30, uh, half an hour to an hour of activity where you're sweating, okay? Moderate to vigorous. I don't think a majority of our kids get this. All right, so I think you need to be aware of how you're sitting. You have to be aware of what you do to undo all that postural strain, but also you just need to go out there and play and be active and sweat and be a kid, all right? And now if you could have more fun on your phone, than you can playing outside, you're gonna probably pick your phone, right? But I think it's our job to kind of encourage them to get out there because there's things you can't replace and activity is one of those things. And that's that.